Good afternoon and welcome to the final day here at the DC Jazz Festival at the Wharf. My name is Sunny Sumter, CEO here at the DC Jazz Festival, and this is one of my favorite parts of the festival this year. We are in conversation with Kim Taylor Thompson, talking about her dad, Dr. Billy Taylor, who we are celebrating the centennial of his birth on July 24th. We are so excited to just take some time in the next hour to talk about Dr. Billy Taylor, to get to know about his life through the eyes of his daughter, Kim Taylor Thompson. Kim, welcome. Thank you, thank you, it's good to, to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have you, and I know we've been talking quite a bit about your dad. You know, when we think about the jazz champion, when you think about your dad, really what comes to mind and why is it important and significant to celebrate his life? Well, I, I want to start by saying on behalf of my mom, who is um, not able to be here, she's 97, so couldn't quite make the trip, and my husband and I, um, as a family, we so appreciate that the DC Jazz Festival is honoring Dad. Jazz was really his lifeblood. Um, he loved everything about what the music does, what it stands for, the way it reaches people. It was a way of expressing um, ourselves as black Americans, just really talking about the kinds of things that we've endured and struggled and overcome and still have yet to overcome. And so the, the fact that you're recognizing that he was not only um, an ambassador for jazz, not only a jazz educator, but a jazz musician. He loved performing, he loved writing, he loved playing, he loved working with audiences. And the fact that you're acknowledging that, it just means so much to my family. Um, he, he loved DC, he loved this music, so um, it, we're really excited about today. Well, DC loved him, <laughs> and we're so glad to claim him as our own. I know he came here when he was five years yeah. old from Greenville, North yeah. Carolina. Yeah. He went to Dunbar. Yeah. Tell us what was significant about his time here in DC okay. during his formative years. So, so you're right, he, he was born in Greenville, North Carolina, and um, his mom was uh, a teacher and his dad was a dentist. And um, they, your grandmother and your grandfather. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. And they, uh, mostly my grandmother, just did not like Greenville. Um, it, it was, definitely the segregated South, and she just didn't feel like it was a safe place to raise her children. So she needled my grandfather and said, we've got to move north. So they moved a little bit north to Raleigh, North Carolina. She said, this is not far enough. And they moved again up to DC. And so dad got here when he was five years old. And the year that he they moved here, um, they realized that they had not actually escaped uh, a lot of the segregation and the racism that they had been enduring in North Carolina. That same year, the Ku Klux Klan um, paraded down Pennsylvania Avenue. So it was right in your face that this was still a very separated, segregated, and dangerous country. But what he loved about where he grew up was that it really was the heart of the black community. And everywhere you turned, you could find black um, professionals, you know, black dentists, black uh, store owners, uh, black doctors. Uh, a lot of the, the people who were in his neighborhood simply couldn't get jobs anyplace else, although they had the qualifications to get it. So there were people who had PhDs who were teaching at Dunbar High School, who today would have been snatched up by a Harvard or a Yale, but they, they couldn't go any further than the, the DC community. So he got the benefit of these amazing minds and talents, um, and he, he recognized that he had something that was really quite special. Um, he, he loved everything about the, the neighborhood up the street from where they ultimately lived on Fairmont Street. Thurgood Marshall lived there. Um, he, um, he talked about how he could just walk to places like the Lincoln Theater or the Howard Theater or Howard University. Um, it, it was a vibrant community where people had high expectations and they expected you to, to achieve something. And he felt that all of his life. So he loved it here. He just loved it. And you talked about Howard Theater right across from it was Florida Avenue Baptist Church. Yeah. And your family has a very important role yeah. in the development of that church, which will really stands tall today yeah. as really a center for spiritual and uh, intellectual and civil rights 
uh, here in DC. Talk yeah. to us about that. My, my great grandfather, um, William A. Taylor, dad was William E. Taylor, but William A. Taylor um, founded the Florida Avenue Baptist Church. And uh, he, he was a, a, a huge figure in the community. He, as you said, was very concerned about not only giving voice to people in the community, but really thinking about ways to push and enable the church to be that voice and to enable people to come and find a, a home, not only a spiritual home, but a place where they could be active and they could be active politically. And one of the things that my great grandfather loved was that um, he had this choir that um, he had his his own children as part of. So my grandfather was the choir director. He was a dentist, but he was also the choir director. Um, he, my great uncles and uh, great aunt uh, performed in the, the choir. So music was something that was really a part of our family and a part of dad's growing up um, and particularly being housed in the church. It was where he grew up and he learned different things about music in that setting. And um, and I think it stayed as an influence in, in his compositions and the kind of music that he played. That is absolutely right. And you know, at Dunbar, while he was there, he actually studied with Henry Grant who you know yes. was the great teacher of Duke Ellington. Exactly. Tell me what he said to you about that. Well, it's funny. Um, Dad uh, loved Henry Green, but that Henry Green wasn't his first um, teacher. That's right, Henry Green. Right. Um, his first teacher was, um, uh, oh, I, I can't think of her first name, but her last name was Streets. And she was his piano teacher because um, my grandmother and grandfather really thought that it was important for their children to have a musical education. So um, Miss Streets um, taught dad and taught my uncle Rudy. And she at some point told my grandmother that you really should not invest any more time or any more money in training Billy because he's not serious about this and he's never going to amount to anything. <laughs> But your other son, Rudy, he's the one. He practices. He really tries hard. He's going to be the one that d does something. So Rudy became a realtor. <laughs> and Dad yes, he was. Did. He sold me my first There dump. you go. There you go. And um, and Dad, uh, you know, obviously um, uh, she was wrong. But, um, but she was wrong because... Um, she noticed things about what he did. He didn't like to practice. He didn't like to prepare at that age. And he, he just, he had a really good ear so he could hear something and then play it. And, um, and so sort of sitting down and getting into the discipline of it was something that he just wasn't ready to do until Henry Green. And um, what, what ended up happening with uh, Mr. Green was that he began to help dad see the importance of really learning the history of jazz and the legacy. He helped him see the connections between European classical music and um, jazz. Um, he had him study things like Debussy's etudes and comparing the harmony that Duke Ellington would do. So he appealed to his intellectual curiosity about the, the music and then encouraged him. He didn't, you know, sort of, uh, um, discipline him for not doing things that he was supposed to do, but encouraged him when he would do things well. And so dad really stepped up in that kind of environment where there was a more of a nurturing um, type of uh, teaching that was going on. Well, that's interesting that he had that reputation as a teenager, because when he graduated, and I'm going to read this from the Dunbar yearbook, it says, captioned next to his photo, a boy whose popularity will never, never wane because his love of harmony will bring his lasting fame. Looking back at your dad's career, true statement, huh? Yeah, I think it is. I, you know, I'd never heard that, and and I've never seen the yearbook, so so that's new to me. But um, yeah, I think um, well, he has had lasting fame, and that's lovely. And and the. The idea that people not only remember him, but remember his music and continue to play his music is just, it's just, it warms your heart. And, and I know he's smiling when he realizes that so many people are still playing his music. But yeah, I think harmony describes him, um, or his love of harmony describes him not only musically, but personally. Um, he was not somebody who, um, he had very strong views, very strong political views. Um, and was really an activist and um, 
Uh, a lot of the things that he was seeing made him really angry, but he, he always approached things as, you know, let's try to find some common ground. Let's try to be reasonable. Let's try to find a way to do this. So he looked for harmony in his interactions with people. And then his music, he was very melodic. His style was um, really designed to, to help people, um, you know, feel the harmony, feel the rhythms, but also just to feel the melody and let the melody move through you. So I think that those were probably the, the right words of prediction for him. Thinking about his compositions, we know his most famous is I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free, written by Dr. Billy Taylor and Dick Dallas. Uh, you know, the, it served as the anthem for the civil rights movement in the 60s. And it was widely, um, you know, it was recorded by Nina Simone in 1967. How do you think the song impacted the civil rights movement yesterday and today? It's a great question. Um, so, so let me come at your question from a slightly different perspective and then ease into what you asked me. <laughs> um, so he liked to tell the story of how he wrote I Wish I Knew. Um, he tells this, would tell the story that um, I had come home from school and I was singing uh, a Negro spiritual that I had learned in school. And I was apparently singing it with a lot of emotion, but singing it all wrong. And um, so he, he uh, came up to me to correct me, to help me understand how to sing it right. Actually, in later tellings of the story, he also said that I was snapping my fingers off beat. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't believe that for a moment. But, but it made the story better. So, so anyway, so apparently I'm singing wrong and snapping off beat. And he is trying to help me understand that, you know, I'm not singing the spiritual correctly. And, you know, I, being the child that I was, I dug in and I said, yes, I am, because Sister Sharon taught me how to sing it. And this, I'm singing it like she taught me. So I was actually arguing with my dad that the white Catholic nuns knew more about Negro spirituals than he did. So, I, you know, I was clearly six or seven, so I was clueless. But, but at the time, he said that that moment... Uh, made him think about spirituals and made him think about what was going on in the world and made him decide that he wanted to sit down and write something. And in the span of 15 minutes, he wrote what would ultimately be his signature song, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free. So you asked about the, the civil rights movement and the impact it had then and now. Um, Dr. King loved the song um, and... Um, but could never remember the name of it because it's a long it's a title. Long title. <laughs> so he would just come up to dad and say, play that churchy song that you always <laughs> play, and dad would play it. Um, but Dr. King liked to come to hear him at the Hickory House, and um, um, he was a huge jazz fan and, and loved um, the music. And I think that um, what really moved dad was that it, it captured not only what he was feeling, but it captured the, the mood of the time. Um, you know, it's it's ultimately, if you listen to the lyrics, it's a lament. It's it's talking about the longing for freedom. It's talking about the desire for freedom that we still don't have. And um, and so when people like Nina Simone would sing it, and she made it her own, um, it, it, you know, lots of people performed. Um, uh, I wish I knew um, from. Leontine Price to Mary Travers of Peter, Paul, and Mary to John Legend to Andre Day. Oh, it's just a, a wide array of people. But Dad loved Nina's version the most because not only did she just have this phrasing and ability to capture the spirit of the song, but she could play the hell out of the piano. So he, he loved the way that she did it. And I think that he was surprised but really moved that um, his piece became one of the anthem anthems of the civil rights movement. Um, and, um, and, and it was something that he was incredibly proud of. Over the past you know, year and a half with the pandemic and all of the um, uh, global uprisings after um, the killing of George Floyd and all of the um, various uh, police killings that we had, um, you know, we've been feeling a lot of the same anger and um, lament about the, the, the fact that our lives are not always seen as something that matters. And um, over the past year and a half, a number of people have been resurrecting I Wish I Knew and singing it again. And it has, it resonates today. 
because it actually, again, captures the fact that we are not anywhere where we need to be. Um, when we talk about freedom, it's not freedom for all, it's freedom for some. And it, it reminds us that we have to keep struggling and we have to get to a better place. So, so I think it's as relevant today as it was back when he wrote it. And it's interesting that you said that um, it's freedom for some because yeah. your dad is quoted as saying that he wrote that song for you. Yeah. Uh, and he said that, um, you know, and, and now that you're actually teaching at NYU and your teaching and scholarship focuses on the impact of race and gender in public policy, particularly criminal and juvenile, uh, juvenile justice policy, uh, and the need for preparing legal students to meet the demands in and on behalf of marginalized communities. Yeah. By the way, that's a tall order <laughs> that you've given yourself to be able to have that charge. Thank you. <laughs> what are some of the ways that Dr. Taylor has influenced your work in this field? And can you share more about your legal work? Sure, sure. Um, you know, dad was, um, as I said, an amazing um, advocate for justice, for racial justice, for social justice. It was really what drove him. Um, the music was something that was a vehicle to get that message out. And early on, um, I, I think when I was probably about nine or 10, he created an organization called Jazzmobile, which oh, you yes. know, um, which actually brings jazz to um, communities of color um, for free, very much like what you're doing with the DC Jazz Festival. But he brought um, the likes of Duke Ellington and Count Basie to the Bronx, to Harlem, to Bedford-Stuyvesant and DC, to communities of color that couldn't afford to hear the music and you go downtown to hear the music. And it, his reasoning was that we created this music, this is our music, and we shouldn't be left out of it. It belongs to us and we need to bring it back. And so that sort of focus on communities that often got left out, uh, were marginalized, was something that I learned directly from him. I have absolutely no musical talent. Um, <laughs> he used to look at my hands. I've got this great stretch. And he said, you know, if only my hands would stretch that far, you could have been a great pianist. And it, nothing. I got none of that. But I did get his political passion. And, um, and so uh, uh, this year, I think, has really driven home um, the need for us to really pay attention to what happens in the justice system. Um, we talked about freedom for some, but when you look at the justice system, it's just us. Um, they are, uh, it's a system that is um, targeting um, certainly young men of color. It is not a restorative system in any ways. It's just a punitive system that really tries to dehumanize people and um, not address the root causes of what um, en enables or encourages people to choose a path that may not be as, as healthy as, as we would like them to choose. And so the work that I do, I, I worked as a public defender in DC for 10 years, and a couple of my um, colleagues are here from um, those times. And um, we, it was important to us to stand on the line and um, be a voice for our clients who are often uh, dismissed as um, just a personification of their charge. You're just a robber, a murderer, or a whatever, without seeing that this is a person, a human being, John Jones, who may have had certain things happen or made choices that could have been better. And um, so we try to stand up and give voice and amplify a voice of people who a system is intent on um, ignoring or silencing. And that's become my life, life's work. Um, as a teacher, I tried to really help students think about the ways that this justice system um, really is continuing to be racist and um, unproductive. Um, we spend a lot of money pe locking people up, but we don't spend any amount of money in, in investing in communities to enable people to have a different set of choices. And my dad really loved that. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, it was consistent with the way he saw the world. He was incredibly proud of um, the work that I did. I, I remember him coming to see me um, very early on when I was at the Public Defender Service. I was a baby lawyer. I was really doing not much of anything. He saw me do what is essentially um, 
um, a status hearing for my um, friends in the audience who know what this is. It's just, it actually wasn't even, it was an arraignment. Um, I was entering a plea of not guilty and setting another date for another hearing. And that's all I did. And when I came off, uh, came back into the courtroom where he was, he, you would have thought I was Perry Mason, you know? <laughs> oh my God, you were so fabulous. It was just wonderful. All I did was just enter my name, say not guilty and set a date, right? But he was proud of me. And, and, and that was the kind of um, encouragement that I lived for, so. That is absolutely wonderful. And I'm sure he's just shining and glowing right now thinking about the great work that you're currently doing. So again, Kim, thank you so much for that. You know, his famous work in radio uh, was probably the National Public Radio Program, Billy Taylor's Jazz at the Kennedy Center. Um, and it was broadcast weekly from hometown DC, yes, where he served as artistic director of uh, jazz for the Kennedy Center. Would you agree that it's, that's his most famous work? Because he was in, he was in broadcast for, for quite a, a number of decades. He was in broadcast for uh, a number of decades. He did um, broadcast um, in New York, and um, he did, even before the Kennedy Center jazz program, he did um, Jazz Live on NPR as well. Um, because he, he wanted to bring jazz into people's homes. And he felt that that was really important to introduce them to jazz artists, to help them understand the music more, and to break it down in ways that um, helped people really feel a connection to the music. So yeah, he was incredibly proud of what he did at Kennedy Center, and he loved the NPR um, broadcast um, because it allowed him to showcase people, not only who were established and uh, that people already knew, the, the Marion McPartlands, the Quincy Jones, um, the, the folks whose names you knew, but also the people who were up and coming um, so that they would have a little bit of a platform to, to um, allow their music to be heard. So um, I, I think that he was proud of the work and he was proud of the reach of NPR. Well, you know, in thinking about his artistic direction work at um, Jazz at the at Kennedy Center, I'm sure you went to a number of those performances because you lived here. So, so when he was um, uh, the head of the, the jazz program, I wasn't here at that point. I had already left. Um, but I did come to a number of performances. Did you have a favorite or a few favorites that you'd like to share? So I, I, um, I, I'm incredibly biased. Um, he, one of the things that he... Um, did was he would bring in um, different artists and feature them and, and help you get to know them. I, I like the ones where it was just his trio <laughs> because it was a chance for me to hear them play. Um, they, um, they had gotten to a point where they were all at virtuoso And when you're talking status. about trio, you're talking about Leonard Harper and, and Chip, Chip Jackson. Jackson. And um, watching them play off of each other was like watching... I don't know, uh, pick, pick your favorite tennis player, um, Serena playing Serena, you know? I mean, it was just, they, they were all just amazing. And you'd hear one and you'd go, oh my God. And then the next one, oh my God. It was just at that level. And so I loved that. Um, there was a performance that I remember that he did. Um, he, he, he was right-handed, but he had a really strong left hand. He had developed it and he had a really strong left hand. And there was a piece that he liked to play um, where he played the entire thing with his left hand. And um, he would sit at the piano and his right hand was just on his knee and he would just go and play. And it would just knock the socks off of the audience because it sounded like more than two hands playing and it was only one. And he, he loved to tell the story that U.B. Blake, um, the, the great musician U.B. Blake said to him, you know, you need to hold a glass in that hand so people can see that, see it. It's not just put it on your knee, but see, you know, hold a drink up there so that they can see that you're actually not using that hand. But there were times when, you know, I heard him play and, and they blew me away. Um, and so, but, you know, he had wonderful guests like Jerry Mulligan who would play with him. He would, um, you know, invite folks like John Faddis to play. It was just uh, Frank West he would feature. So there were a number of concerts that I watched that were just um, mind-blowing and wonderful. That's wonderful. And, you know, I had the distinct pleasure of sharing the stage with him 
I actually performed with your dad. Oh my God, I love and, it, I love um, it. He was so loving and he brought the very best out in me, I have to say oh, on that segment. So uh, it felt wonderful. And, and my family, as you know, is very close with the Taylors, the Jordans, and it would, they were all in the audience that day. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, Dr. Taylor presented to the Library of Congress his entire jazz collection of memorabilia. It's one of the largest and most inclusive jazz archives ever acquired by the library. What are your some of your favorites in that jazz collection? So on, on, the, uh, on his 80th birthday, he decided that he was going to um, contribute a lot of his music. He still has other music um, that has yet to be distributed, um, but um, it, it's the largest jazz collection in the Library of Congress. And it consists of um, original scores. Um, so, you know, you've got his handwritten music. Um, it's the books that he's written. He wrote about 12 books. Um, but what I like best about what's in the uh, collection is that he used to do a number of lecture demonstrations. So he would go to colleges and um, play music and um, um, engage in a give and take with the, the musicians that he was featuring, asking them why they played things to help people understand what the music was all about. Then he would take questions from the audience and play things and demonstrate things. And he recorded all of them. He just sat there with some a little cassette player on the piano. Yeah, back then it was a cassette player. <laughs> and, um, and just record them. So he donated a lot of those. So it's actually hearing him really at his prime, um, playing some amazing music. It, it's funny, when I talked with him in later years about um, you know, when he, what it felt like to listen to some of those earlier sessions, he said, you know, it almost doesn't sound like me. He said, um, I played so fast back then, because <laughs> he had slowed down a little bit as he got into his 80s. But, um, but you can hear him playing at speed and, and playing um, you know, these amazing tunes. So that's what I think I like best about what's in the collection. That's wonderful. Well, I think we have a few more minutes, so I'm going to allow some uh, Q&A. If there's anyone would, that would like to come up and ask Kim Taylor Thompson a question, there's a microphone right there. Don't be shy. I just have to say that sitting here, as I, as I, as I'm watching you speak, you when you smile and turn your head in a certain way, it really feels like Billy Taylor is sitting here. He can't deny me, right? <laughs> I'm here. I'm him right here. <laughs> what would you say, as far as the fact that he was such an ambassador for yeah. this music? How did he take on that mantle of being an ambassador? Because, I mean, you can talk the talk yeah. uh, all you want. And I've heard a number of musicians talking the talk. Yeah. But he actually walked the walk as far as being a world ambassador for this music. What was it about him and his character that brought that upon him, that, 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 that he felt compelled to be that ambassador? Thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's a, probably a complicated answer, so bear with me as I try to break it down a bit about what I think um, um, made him feel the need to be that ambassador. Um, early on, um, actually right after he and my mom got married, he had an opportunity to uh, go to Europe. Uh, there was a band that um, uh, Don Redman, who is the great uncle to Joshua Redman, um, was Dewey. for, say again? Dewey. Yes. Oh, but Don's the uncle. Yeah, Don is the uncle, right. And um, Don Redman put together this all-star band to go to Europe right after World War II. And it was supposed to be like a, a week or two weeks and it turned into something like four months. So um, my, my dad had just gotten married to my mom and um, uh, told Don, I can't, just leave my wife for like that amount of time. I just got married. And so Don said, well, bring her. So they had an extended honeymoon for months in, in um, Europe. And what he felt when he was there was that the music was accepted and valued and treasured in 
all the parts of Europe that he went to in ways that he had never experienced it here. He said they would get off the, the plane and there would be bands waiting for them playing music. He said, we were treated like royalty. And it was a, a largely black um, um, orchestra that, that was traveling. And so he began to see that um, the ways that the world understood this to be America's classical music were not being seen back at home. And when he came back home, they did not get the kind of welcome that you know they had gotten in Europe. But he said, we need to do something about that. And so I think that not only did he want to improve his own craft, but I think he wanted to make sure that other people really began to appreciate what this art form was. So he looked for different ways to do that. He did radio. He did. Um, uh, you know, a number of things with the State Department. He got sent places to, to talk about music and talk about jazz. He brought jazz into schools because he thought that it was really important that kids in public school understand what it is that that legacy is and that it's continuing to thrive. Um, and so I think that when he started doing that, he began to recognize that he had a voice um, and that he could that people were willing to listen to it. Um, you know, he was um, somebody who liked to talk, liked to tell stories. And, and I think that he could find ways to really capture the, the spirit and the attention of lots of different audiences. And so he began to make sure that he did that. Um, so through his music, through his education, through his travels, um, through the various media, um, radio, TV, um, he found way, and ultimately the internet, he, he found ways, I think, to help people recognize the beauty of this music, to feel its defiance and its, its bravery and its um, you know, strong connection to our African heritage. And, um, and he used that and tried to educate around it. Hi. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My name is Gail Boyd. I'm a manager of jazz artists. Oh. And I've had an opportunity to speak to your father on many occasions. In fact, he lived in Riverdale. I had lived in Riverdale at one point. Oh and I just checked my phone to see if I still had his number, and I do. Well, you could call because my mom's there. <laughs> But I wanted to tell the story about the legacy of one person that your father influenced, and it's a young pianist named Deanna Witkowski. And when she first came to the Kennedy Center by way of invitation from your dad, he told her that she needed to dig into the legacy of Mary Lou Williams. And it was through your father that she met and got, a, not met her, but got an opportunity to know who she was. She's now gone on to write a book about Mary Lou Williams. She has a recording coming out about Mary Lou Williams and she's now getting her PhD about the sacred stories of Mary Lou Williams and that's all because of your father. Oh my God, thank you for sharing that story. And you know, it's, we all know the Mary Lou Williams Jazz Festival, he started that at the Kennedy Center, which we'll get into in the next segment with, right. with Bernard and with Chip. Uh, but that, thank you, uh, Gail, for really sharing that. And I should mention that Gail's an attorney as well. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't. I clearly wouldn't. <laughs> do we have time for one more question, Heidi? Yeah. We do. Is there anyone else that would like to come up and ask a question? Take your time. And also say your full name because we are recording this. Hi, it's a pleasure hearing you. Hi. <clears throat> My full name is Walter Beach III. Nice to meet you. Okay, thank you. I heard uh, the doctor lecture one time, and the story you just shared about the left hand. In the lecture, he said Nina Simone had the strongest, one of the strongest left hands that he had ever heard. So I would just say that was this relevant to what he she was did. She didn't. I think. Thank you for that. I, I think that's what he loved about her playing was that she she was also classically trained um, and um, just an amazing pianist. 
And he, from the moment he met her and heard her, he loved her singing. He loved the way that she could capture an emotion musically and could move an entire audience just with that voice. And But he loved her playing. Um, he just loved the way that she um, used that left hand. That was big for him. <laughs> and uh, um, that she just um, brought all of the musical dimensions together in a way that nobody else did. Well, Kim, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And you know, I am a big fan of your of your legal work and, you know, a champion. And it's been wonderful to get to know you and to understand your dad more through the through your lens. So thank you so much oh, for thank you, taking Sonny. time. Thank you for doing that. And, and, thank, and we'll be back for another rendition of this that will include Bernard Harper and Chip Jackson in just a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you.